This is the Dog Savant Podcast with your host, Brett Endes. Oh, hello. Uh, we are in podcast number nine. I'm Brett. I'm your host. Thank you for tuning in or watching or listening. Um, this is going to be an emotion versus leadership. What, what were we going to call it, Jordan? Emotion lotion. Emotion lotion? <laughs> That's something else. Emotional lotion? What, what are we going to call this? I think that sounds great. Emotion versus leadership. I think that was it. Emotion versus leadership. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the two, how they are different, and how both can help or hurt when overdone or not understood. Uh podcast. Uh, we are on episode nine. We're excited. This is going to be a supplement to my show, The Untrainables, on Facebook Watch that comes out Saturday, September 8th for the first episode. We shot 12 episodes last week. I'm very proud of it, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did making it, and I hope you learned something from it. I hope you can help your dog by some of the things you take from that, and I hope you can help your dogs from what you learn from this podcast. Um, I'm Again, I'm Brett, your host, Brett Endes. I am called the Dog Savant. I'm a Los Angeles-based dog trainer. Uh, I don't talk enough about what I do, really. This is just kind of what I do on the side to share some of the info, but all day long, I'm talking dog. I am meeting with clients. I have uh, practice where I specialize in the more difficult dogs, severe problem behaviors, and I found that if you cannot train an owner, you're not able to train their dog. Uh, it's not just a slogan or a tagline, it's the truth, and I do this a lot. I've done it a long time, and I do this every day. Um, here in Los Angeles, there's a lot of dogs that need it, as is, I'm sure, anywhere where you, oh, excuse me, is where you may be living, uh, and if you have your own dog and it could benefit or from this uh, or what you apply from what I teach in this, all, all the better. Uh, I said in my last podcast, what I say in these shows is not my hearsay or opinion. It's not my emotions driving this. I have an emotion, if you will, as a strong feeling about something that I've observed, you know, consistently over a period of time and hearing enough different people give me similar stories, I draw enough of an understanding or a conclusion, if you will, as to what may be driving things. And some people, unfortunately, don't like hearing that truth. And that's where the emotions can get in the way of sometimes helping our dogs or ourselves. So uh, I come from a place of experience. It's not my opinion at this point. The dogs have taught me and I'm still learning and I just come from, like I said, a lot of arm-related people telling me a similar experience that what I'm teaching them is helping their dogs in many cases where other training or approaches to training did not do that. And so I feel pretty confident that what I'm sharing is good for dogs, good for owners, and can help you too. Uh, so let's move forward. Let's talk about emotion versus uh, leadership. What's emotion? It's feelings we get. It's what makes us love. It's what makes us connected. It's what makes us care. But sometimes it can make us blind. It can make us see things that aren't there because it makes us feel a certain way. And I think in nowadays, a lot of kids are, or people are validated and, show, and told that everything they feel is true, and then they start becoming deluded by their feelings. And towards animals, we're allowed to indulge in feelings. Who doesn't get excited when their pet rushes up to you and gets overstimulated when you come in because they're so excited to see you and we want to reward that back and reciprocate. However, if your dog is having an issue with separation anxiety or overreacting to guests in a negative way and other greetings other than you, we may have to create some more structure and leadership and take what we like emotionally away from the situation to deal what reality is requiring via our leadership structure. And one day we find a happy medium where the balance of structure and the indulgence can be found, you know, so we get what we want, the dogs get what they want. But I always say dogs' needs come first. If you have a deficiency in their ability, the dogs, to navigate everyday life situations and transitions in a way that promotes a more go with the flow mindset versus a over anxious, overreacted, overstimulated response, which is the root cause of most of your behavior issues or lack of listening uh, when it comes to dogs. Um, so emotions, um, I find that some people, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be more politically incorrect than I need to be, but I find that certain uh, people, you know, so I, I'll, you know, I'll go as far as saying some people that don't have kids have a harder time with this. Sometimes small dog owners tend to indulge more in their 
dopamine, you know, drip than sometimes seeing what's going on. So they baby their dogs, uh, sometimes not into good places. Uh, there's a lot of rescues that will, uh, I commend the work rescues do, but a lot of them really believe in their heart that they're going to love years of a dog's behavioral issues away. Or if a dog has had a negative past or trauma traumatic experience, they're uh, going to coddle them and tell them it's going to all be okay. I find that maybe in a moment it can console them, but it does not afford growth in a dog. It does not get a dog to see how to st uh, navigate everyday life from whatever had happened in the past on as not being a threat anymore because of the situation they're now in that is safer and well provided for, taken care of. So coddling them when they're nervous, our emotions feel like we're caring and we're doing something good, but all we're telling the dog is you're okay to overreact to someone that's a friendly person that has no ill intent, so let me try to build you up a little bit and then coddle you when you have a better potential. And now, on the flip side, say, oh, if you're not doing that, what are you doing, beating the dog? No, we're not abusing them. We're building up. We're creating a sensory integrated state. We're creating focus. We're creating leadership. The commands that I always talk about are a way to get a dog's mind and body connected. So by doing that, you end up getting them to feel that you're leading them through it. And that's where you become more of a leader in these situations than an emotional wreck uh, and promoting that in them. Because we project, I find dogs that never had a traumatic experience and because the owners are using the dogs too much for their emotional needs, um, they're like, I, I, I think you need to go see a therapist person. I, I, I can't handle this, maybe a little bit. I mean, I'll, a dog can be a seeing eye dog, right? A dog can take care of tasks. A dog can be a protector. But a dog can't handle the depth of human psychological issues if you're fully relying on them as a crutch. They can help you feel less anxious when with them, but if you're putting all your stuff on them, like again, you should be doing when you're in front of a therapist, there's, it's just, I find, again, I go only by pattern, not opinion. It never works out good. It's actually some of the more deficient cases. Some of the dogs with the biggest, deepest rooted issues are from overly emotional owners who can't see how they're projecting this onto the dog. And usually they also are very challenged in being able to rationally take care of what a dog needs because they think that it's mean not being driven purely by an emotional state when around a dog, which is, again, all I know is is causing the issue. Um, so I'll even give an example is that when we were doing the show, The Untrainables, and you'll see this come up in the future episodes, it might be even, I think, episode two, uh, there was a dog and he had uh, bit me and he was really didn't like being uh, you know, brushed, handled. He had limitations of anything the owner would ask him to do, places she would bring him. He, it was on his terms, so what he said went. Yet she had, I didn't bring it up in the show, it just, I didn't, my mind think at the time to go there. But I saw an, an emotional support kind of thing. And, you know, after the fact, it just reminded me, it's like this lady, and she was one of the few that I knew, like when we talk about, oh, you're going to go home and take the information Brett you know, taught you and practice with your dog. Uh, I really had doubts that she was going to be able to follow through. And uh, again, directly related to a lot of these people think that asking a dog to listen, feel content with the situation instead of overreactive, which always makes a dog take everyday life as, oh, my God, this could be it. And they act a little over, you know, they overdo it. Um her emotional block was not going to allow any progress. Maybe I'll be surprised. I'll, I'll see when they air the episode what, you know, they did a little bit of a progress report after the fact with the clients. But um, these these are harder, you know, uh, than, you know, for people because of that thing within them that they can't see more of what a dog needs in terms of leading them um, in a more objective way. Because, again, these dogs that have had bad past, you coddling them and trying to console them and explain how you understand – Maybe that's what we need. I don't know so much anymore, but maybe as humans we need someone to sit down and hear about how our parents were shitty to us. Or I, I used to think that too, but as I get older, I, I think that the better, more productive way to think, and not just like like task-wise productive, but like getting like your mind in sorts, is to just deal with shit and move on and make your life better and take charge and ownership of what you do. And that's what we have to do for a dog because they don't have that ability if they've never been taught or they have a bad experience or you have a history in a relationship with them that has to change. And I tell you, I do that a lot. I have a lot of dogs that are a result of the owner raising them, not in the optimum way. And what happens? Um, 
it's the owners who I have to spend a lot more time changing their habits, their emotional thinking, and seeing that what they're asking their dog to do is not mean just because it doesn't feel emotionally like a thing that they're supposed to do. Look, I have a lot of people that are opposed to crate training, and it's always because they're picturing themselves in the crate with like as if it was a, they were the dog. And I'm like, well, you didn't. The, if you don't make it seem like jail, just like when you go in your room and go to sleep, it's not a big deal. But it's I wouldn't want to be. As soon as they start going with the I. They're telegraphing their own psychology onto the dog, and that's where, again, emotional support people think that this dog is so complex that it's going to handle, you know, an anxiety that was from subpar parenting they had as a child that they have to go through years of therapy to work through or meditate or whatever it is. I'm not making fun. Again, when I say these things, I'm half-joking sometimes, but it's really just to shed light on something that really has to be addressed more. And this is, again, this can deviate way out of the dog realm. This is a human realm thing, too, with this kind of over-emotional response to parenting. People treat their kids like they're extension of themselves, like they're all buddies. Um, we'll do a podcast on that, too. Um, you know, people... You know, they were raised in a way, so now they project, like, the contrast onto their kid, and there's a balance in everything. There's a balance in nature. There's a balance in dogs, children, relationships. Everything finds a set point, good, bad, or, or, or indifferent. And making it all sunshine and roses and all, oh, it's good, you don't talk about this. There's no growth in that. You know, you'll have people like my daughter who would never have learned how to speak or take care of her basic needs for herself if I didn't push and we just went with what was comfortable and stretched her out of her comfort zone. I've seen countless thousands of dogs the same thing that if we expected more from them and you know skillfully communicated that and taught them consistently um, you know which doesn't require treats or correcting them or beating them it's just connecting with them right it's um, I've seen these dogs grow too I only speak from seeing things with my own eyes so uh, the way we think now is more of just comfort and convenience and never deal with anything that is, you know, physically, I think people can deal with more, I think, now than mentally discomfort. And uh, you got to stretch yourself on both levels to be healthy mentally and physically. Uh, and this goes for dogs, too. And that is not something that emotions, there's no time for that. There's no place for that when you're, you know, I don't think someone who's running a marathon and there are, you know, these ultra marathoners who go like 100 miles in one run. Um, they're at like mile 70 and they're like, oh, I got 30 miles to go, which would be ridiculous for any normal person. And they're in pain, whatever's, you know, again, I'm exaggerating because I don't know the specifics, but all I hear from these people are is it's all their brain telling them you just suck it up and do it. And I think if they start emotionally, oh, poor me, I'm going to get hurt, this and that. They're never going to push themselves and reach a new pinnacle, a new bar being set. And dogs, we don't have to push them like to the point of discomfort. But what what what's discomfort? Asking them to accept life on life's terms so that they can grow and then see everyday stuff without this whole, I have to warm up to things or I have to be hidden from fireworks. That's another thing we talk. The fireworks, a lot of the information you get on 4th of July is keep coddle them. These poor dogs, these bad, bad humans are... Be, you know, lighting fireworks. It's like, look, th that's the world. And if you take the 364 days a year that are not 4th of July, your dog might learn to desensitize to it if you understand them and know how to. Because it, I see dogs that have issues like that, and it's not that hard. And with some time, patience, and, and again, awareness, understanding, you can build them instead of just default, oh, we'll just avoid it. For your own convenience too, probably, because you don't want to be uncomfortable having to train your dog and you want to do the fun stuff all the time. It doesn't work that way. It's a two-way street, and sometimes it's one way on the other direction. You have to do all the heavy lifting if you didn't raise your dog, you know, in a, in a proper way, or you are taking a dog that had bad past history or didn't learn from someone else, which I commend anyone for, but someone's got to do this. Someone has to step up and be consistent and be more of a leader. So what does leader mean? Right, I talked a lot about emotions because emotions are what gets in the way more than anything. I'll take an owner that... It tries their best, gets it, but they just don't have the time, you know, and they put it in when they can or they're not that consistent. They just have to be better handlers. That we can more learn. That's just like anything. If you're focused, you can learn something with time and practice. Emotional stuff, when you push these people too much, these are the clients that I'll just, you know, you know, let's let's throw in the towel here. I'll refund your money. I think this is going to be too much I'm asking of you. Very rare. You know, I think more people need like, just help me. But sometimes you get that. And that's where I talk about the patterns I see. It's just, you know, do this enough. You kind of see a constant. Um, anyway, so that's the emotional. And I think that's really challenging for a lot of dogs 
and owners, a lot of rescues, a lot of people that interact with dogs. They're not giving, they're going with what feels good, not what is required. Very different things. A lot of times in people's feelings, they'll even stop a guy like me from doing a training session with a dog that could be doing amazing. Like the dog is actually like tolerating another dog and then we get yelled at because we're using a training collar. I'm like, did you see this dog three weeks ago? Do you understand what was going on here? Do you see how calm and happy this dog is? It's something that they were not only physically discomfortable in a harness or some other thing they were using to walk. Now we have a nice calm association with walking. But also like the dog isn't seeing like this other dog here is a potential threat. So now we can walk without your dog having, I'm in a war zone type of anxiety. Like how is that? But you see something, you feel a certain way when you look at that collar and now you have this emotional response that wants to drive you to tell someone who may even be wearing a shirt that says he's a professional dog trainer like you know better. And look, you can go on my YouTube page, guys. You can see some of the comments of what people make. And I, I really like to see what they're actually doing and the body of work behind them. And I'm not talking about videos and social media posts. I'm talking about satisfied clients whose dogs you helped when there were some dire situations going on prior. Um, anyway, don't want to tell myself too much, but that's why I speak out about certain things the way I do. Uh, anyway, leadership. People, a lot of people are on the whole pack leader kick. Caesar Milan, who I don't have a problem with. I think he could be more skillful in how he explains things. I think he gets a little theatrical in his ch -ch -ch shit. And I think he also um, could be a little less physical with the dogs, a little him less him versus the dog, a little try to get connected with the dog, but energy, all that pack leadership, he, he gets it. So leadership, it's a very misunderstood thing. It, uh, you know, people sometimes think it means you have to be physically domineering or threatening to your dog or yell or pin them on their back or, you know, there's rules of, of engagement, but you don't have to be so physically domineering. It's more of being a step ahead of them, guiding them. I talk a lot about the place training in previous podcasts and videos I do, and it's talking about creating structure in the everyday life between you and your dog and an awareness. Leadership is an awareness. You know the dogs better than they understand themselves and the relational dynamics you share. So it's knowing where a dog needs direction. And I help owners with that. So they can just tap into this thing that just once you kind of create that role, it takes a life of their own. And you don't have to prove it so much. But some dogs, it just has to be a general state of mind and you can live with them without spelling it out. Some dogs, you have to have the state of mind and then do some training and direction as far as giving them commands, place, when to be where and when, put things on your terms, at least when you're reestablishing better habits or resolving some bad history uh you know so it, that's what a leader is it's somebody who's like a good boss you're not going to disrespect the boss but you're not scared of them they provide for you you provide for them but they know situations better they can train you to do something that you haven't learned before because they're more experienced in that realm and that's the problem is we're giving dogs a little too much uh you know empowerment authority too many choices when they can. I don't like even dogs asking owners for something, like ask for attention, ask for going to the bathroom, because I've observed it only ends up to having more anxiety because they're like, well, what's next? What's next? What's next? What do I have to think about? Why engage that in a dog? Why do you even have to get them unless it's just chilling out, letting you dictate because you know how to take care of them and when their needs need to get met? Whatever it is, food, attention, bathroom visits, uh, exercise, pet, whatever it is, they're going to get it if you're good at taking care of your dog. They shouldn't ask for it because it puts them in a position to now second guess humans' ability to lead them through life. And that's what a leader does, whether naturally implied because you're a human and don't walk on two legs or it takes improving, which is what training really is when you're dealing with some behavioral you know, uh, issues between you, know, you and your dog or your dog in everyday life. Um, so a leader is not someone, yes, a leader has, you know, you don't let a dog lay on you and you don't let a dog on your furniture if you're trying to prove leadership. At some point that can be negotiated. Um, but there is a respect of space that, um, you know, there is little things that are kind of Caesar Milan-esque, but, uh, walking around like with your chest out all the time, you know, that, that's a little overdone. I think if anything, the dogs know you're trying too hard. So you have to find that balance too in the demeanor and the awareness and when to direct when and what as far as how you train the dogs, lead them, guide them through life. Um, you know, you have to kind of find out. And I do a lot of talks about that in prior podcasts. I also have uh, my old web series, my new uh, series, The Untrainables, will talk about that too. Um, so I just wanted to just discern because, you know, Caesar said it, I think, in one of his books, that people think, you know, dominant, the dominant dog is the 
you know, whips and chains and all that weird shit. And it's not. It's really just a dog that, you know, a wolf or whoever, a person is more experienced than those around them and through that experience earns the respect and follows and plays the part. And whenever there's a need for order or someone to direct or train or guide or teach or mentor or protect or handle a stressful situation, they're the ones they default to. That's why your dog can't be coddled when they're freaking out because they're looking for you to guide them and dogs don't create emotion. They create balance and leadership, which is creating the feel-good thing that, of course, the intention, you're not being, well, I didn't know what to do. Of course, no one knows what to do. We mean well. Everything good, the feeling thing, I don't think anyone's doing that vindictively or with malicious intent. I think it's just that's what makes sense to most humans. And when you're around enough dogs and see what works and what doesn't, it they train you to be more objective and more of a leader than, than an emotion-based person around them when their needs are being you know, they, they have these needs that are demanded or however you want to say. Um, so that's really what it is. It's almost up to us to be a step ahead of them, understand what situations are going to be challenging or where they require leadership and direct them through it so that just in our presence it happens. So some dogs that can happen, some dogs you have to, again, show them that through the training. Um, I guess that's a pretty good picture I painted. I think, I, um, you know, as far as what, it's a good subject. It's a thing. It's not so much like last uh, uh, podcast episode, we talked about the recall, the come command. That's just logistical. You put in the time, train your dog, you'll get a, a, a certain kind of response. That's just conditioning the training consistency. Um, this is like a thing. It's like a vibe. You got to be like self-aware and you got to recognize your energy inside and catch yourself and think like there's a little kazoo over your head telling you what's going on when you're just living. Uh, Because sometimes we go into autopilot, me included. I'm not above this. Uh, And I think I indulge in it sometimes more than I tell my clients they may be allowed to at first because they have to create a certain relationship with their dog. Um, Okay, so I think that's good for this podcast. Um, Stay tuned. We will try to put podcasts out every week. Uh, There's a video version of this again on YouTube, on Vimeo. There's an audio only on YouTube, so you can listen that way. iTunes, don't forget to subscribe to this to give a good review. Um, And again, September 8th, The Untrainables on Facebook Watch on The Pet Collective. Support that show. This is huge for me. I want this to continue. And um, thank you so much for watching, and uh, make sure you lead your dog.